in our world today, um, NGOs play an ever increasingly important and critical role. I have been associated with NGOs in the role of a consultant now for several decades, almost 30 years. And what I can say is that more and more the role of NGOs has become ever increasingly important. Today's lecture is about the special challenges that are associated with professionalizing, uh, which in some ways means corporatizing, but I use the word corporatizing with a lot of caution. So professionalizing of NGO management and uh, also with special reference to Muslim NGOs. Having said that, I hope that my what I have to say will be of benefit to all NGOs and the people who work in them and the people who run them, uh, whether they are Muslim NGOs or not. <coughs> uh, I have mentioned some things that are specific to Muslim NGOs, like, for example, the collection and disbursement of zakat, because that's uh, one, which is the compulsory charity that every Muslim is uh, who has uh, a certain specific amount of money uh, is obliged to give to the poor. Um, but I think uh, the rest of, of what I have to say uh, refers to any kind of NGO. Charity can be done in many ways. The benefit of doing that in a systematic, sustainable way is that the results are multiplied and they last longer. Sitting outside your home all night in Ramadan, doling out money or material to a long line of supplicants may make you feel very generous. But remember, making people stand in a line like beggars to take aid from your hand is a sign of arrogance. It is not only important to give, but to give, keeping the dignity of the receiver as the primary consideration. I'm sure many of us have seen the very painful and shameful visual of uh, a person who is uh, who's, uh, who's handicapped uh, being literally made to crawl uh, and, and uh, crawl up a stage uh, in order to receive a wheelchair uh, from some dignitary who has come to that particular function to, within quotes, grace it. Uh, that's an utterly shameful visual. Uh, I have seen that a couple of times. Not, not personally, I was never in that function or, or that wouldn't have happened. I would have stopped it. But I've seen videos of that. And uh, I'm just quoting that as an example. Uh, when you are giving something to somebody, give it with dignity or don't give it. Because it's uh, utterly uh, despicable to use somebody's uh, compulsion uh, and somebody's uh, weakness as a way of showing off your generosity uh, and uh, your grace and, and greatness. There is nothing great or generous about that. That's very, very shameful. So therefore, in Islam, uh, it is recommended to give in a way where your left hand does not know what your right hand gave. And believe me, that's the best thing for our ego and it is the best thing for the dignity of the receiver. To return to the... Um, example uh, which is I gave just now of uh, somebody is sitting and doling out money or clothes or food or whatever uh, to individuals. Um, if a trust fund for example is set up uh, then this charity can become self-sustaining and it can go on much longer than the lifetime of that person 
even assuming that this person does this particular charity uh, all his life long, the trust fund is something that will uh, ensure that this charity happens and happens at a much better rate and, and, and much more productively. Now Muslims have uh, always been among the most generous people in the world uh, as a group, as a community. Uh, I would probably not be wrong if I say that we are the most generous. Uh, our system of zakat uh, is an element of our creed. It is about being a Muslim. And it takes wealth from the rich and gives it not to a masjid or to a madrasa or to a guru or to a darga or to a priest, uh, but directly to the beneficiary. And obviously, there's not even, there isn't, a, there isn't any priesthood in Islam in the first place. So it cannot be given to a priest anyway. But um, zakat is charity that is taken from the savings. It's not income tax, it's a, it's a savings tax, wealth tax which is taken from a person of wealth and given to directly to the beneficiary, to the poor person uh, who it benefits and it is, uh, it is part of the usul, uh, part of the rules of zakat that this charity which is given must be given without any strings attached, uh, without any compulsion on the receiver to do this or that with it. So you can't, for example, give it to somebody and say, uh, use this only for this purpose. That, that, that invalidates it. You cannot do that. You can advise the person. It's better for you to use it for this purpose. For example, to pay the fees, uh, school fees of your children. But you can't compel them. You can't say that, uh, you know, you must not use it for anything other than paying the school fees. That invalidates it. Um, secondly, you can't uh, give zakat as a loan. Uh, it has to be given and the receiver is to be made the owner of that, meaning that the receiver can then do whatever he or she likes with it. So this is a very specific form of charity and it is focused very directly uh, to the beneficiary. It's not uh, the, the, the giver uh, is does not have control over what the beneficiary does uh, with that charity. Second thing is, as I mentioned earlier, zakat is not left to the generosity of the individual, but it is obligatory on every Muslim who has the specified amount of nisab. And nisab is the term uh, which defines the, the quantity of money uh, or gold or silver uh, that a person must have in order for that person to be eligible to pay zakat. And it also, uh, by definition, therefore, uh, refers to uh, the amount of gold, silver and so on, a person uh, must have l less than uh, if they are to receive that zakat. So if a person who has ex so much of gold and silver and so forth, uh, they are eligible to receive zakat and if they have less than that, they can, uh, if they have so much, they can, they are eligible to give it and if they are, uh, if they have less than that, they are eligible to receive it. Um, so Muslims give, um, uh, more uh, charity perhaps as I mentioned than uh, year after year than any other communities. I remember uh, seeing uh, an estimate recently which said that uh, Muslims give close to half a trillion dollars globally speaking in charity every year, year after year. But then you might say well how come that Muslims in most countries still are the poorest people. Why? The, I mean, after so much of charity is given and uh, so obviously the people giving charity are Muslims also. So they have that money is available in the, in the community and so many people are receiving it. Despite that, how come there is so much poverty? And I think the, the answer lies in the, in the way that is given, which is it is given, uh, one, it is given sporadically and secondly, it's given in such a dispersed manner uh, that it is, uh, it doesn't do the kind of good that it has the power to do. So therefore, I would say that what we as Muslims, in terms of our charity, what we lack uh, is systems and processes to ensure the efficiency of giving and of its effectiveness. Um, now, if you think about uh, the history of, uh, of Muslims, uh, going back to the time of, uh, of Rasulullah to the time of the Prophet Muhammad 
peace be upon him. Uh, historically, we have almost no examples of NGOs as organizations, non-governmental organizations for charity. We have almost no examples of NGO organizations because the Muslim state was responsible. This is part of the uh, the political uh, political structure of Islam that if there is a Muslim state, meaning a state which is ruled by Muslims uh, and it is ruled according to the uh, Sharia of Islam, then charity is the responsibility of the state. Social work and social welfare is the responsibility of the state and where uh, and, and we, we see this happening uh, if you read the history of Islam, uh, the state by and large has carried out uh, that social work and that social welfare uh, pretty well uh, throughout the history uh, of uh, Islam from the 7th century coming up to now. Now, apart from the state, uh, also what happened and what used to happen, it, has to, it happens even now, the I see as resurgence of that, um, is the issue of waqf uh, or religious endowment. So this is... Uh, this is a property that is, or it's, um, uh, it is property or uh, money uh, and so on, which is endowed, which is uh, set aside by a person, or whoever it is, generous person, uh, in order to benefit uh, the uh, benefit uh, Muslims and others in certain specific ways. So, for example, you might have a waqf to run a particular school or a waqf for a university or a waqf to we set up a masjid, a waqf to run a madrasa, a waqf to run a hospital, a waqf to feed people. So, it can be for any any uh, good general welfare purpose. Um, this has also been a part of the um, of the of the culture and the. Um, and, and the norm in the Muslim world. And I see a, a resurgence of that, uh, a particular note I would mention uh, is in South Africa where uh, the Waqf is, that they've set up uh, the Awqaf and they're doing a, a very, very good job uh, with that. Uh, so Waqf properties and their managements, uh, this has, uh, this this has also been one of the, uh, one of the, the hallmarks of uh, Muslim charity. Uh, a waqf is usually run by a mutawalli, which is uh, a trustee, or in some cases might be more than one uh, trustee. There would be a chief trustee, uh, and then there would be a, a, a council of uh, trustees, which runs that waqf. Now, many times, these awqaf, uh, which is the plural of waqf, waqf is a singular, awqaf is plural. Uh, many times, these awqaf were huge, they were multi multi million multi billion dollar uh, if you look at in terms of their uh, of their worth, net worth and they obviously reflect the generosity of spirit of muslims who globally left literally millions of square miles of land and buildings and they built schools and hospitals and they set up universities and so on however none of these were organizational in nature and when i say organizational uh, I mean um, from a corporate angle. Now you might say, well, what's the big deal about being, co being uh, you know, organizational from a corporate angle? Well, why, why should that be? And we'll look at that in a, in a minute and that's why I want to uh, mention that specifically. So these were not organizational. These, these were like, uh, you know, I would set up a waqf and um, I would run it as long as I was alive and then I would dominate uh, somebody as a mutawalli, usually in most cases, it happens to be the, the, the son uh, of uh, that family. In some cases, it might be uh, a friend or a, or a brother or somebody uh, who runs it. And they do, they do their job to the best of their ability. Uh, they gather a few people around them uh, who are like-minded, who are you know, interested in uh, running it and in the welfare of it. And this, and this just continues. Um, what is lacking are the systems and processes. So, this uh, used to happen. So, traditionally, we had these awqaf and we had uh, the mutawallis, the trustees running them. Uh, but as I said, none of them were organizations and organizational um, in the sense that we understand today when we say a corporate organization. But you can say, well, you know, times were different, values were different, uh, people's standards were different, their aspirations and dedication, these were all different. And by and large, I'm not 
I'm not selling to you the line that the past is always better than the present. It is not. Uh, but by and large, there were people who were more dedicated, less greedy, um, and so on and so forth. I'm sure you can find examples uh, to counter what I'm saying. Don't get into that. Just let's let's uh, uh, stay with me in this. So, for better or worse, these people ran those aukaf and they uh, and they did uh, a, a reasonable job. But as times progressed, uh, things uh, started falling apart, and we have any number of examples. Uh, some of the biggest ones in in my city, in my country, in India and in Hyderabad, uh, where there is a huge uh, and has been for now, you know, several decades, if I can say that, a uh, huge mismanagement of Aukhaf, of uh, Mutawalli's, uh, Mutawalli's uh, breaking their trust and, and mismanaging Aukhaf. So things like, <coughs> things like record keeping, data gathering, management reporting, uh, monitoring effectiveness, performance assessment, uh, training, especially leadership development training uh, to prepare uh, successors, systematic recruitment based on qualification, not based on uh, psycho fancy or based on, you know, I like this, I like this, the look on that fellow's face kind of thing. Uh, proper succession planning, formal mentoring, compensation, benefits, uh, career paths, retirement benefits, none of these existed or exist in uh, in Awqaf, illa mashallah, uh, except where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has caused this to happen. Consequently, uh, while there was uh, a lot of dedication, there was also, as I mentioned, a lot of misuse of both the capital and the revenue from the Awqaf. Uh, to the extent that in many places, uh, mutawallis, which are the trustees, they broke the trust and they sold Aukaf properties and buildings uh, to builders and to others. And so the very purpose of the of the waqf was defeated. Now, even where mutawallis were honest and uh, dedicated, everything revolves around the personal commitment of an individual. Now, there are no systems to care for the needs and aspirations and dynamics of those who work with him. Further, since there is no formal system of succession planning, mentoring and training, there is no retirement age of the mutawallis, the work, the waqf quickly becomes a zamindari. It becomes a kind of landlordship which is passed on from father to son. It becomes a family business. Uh, no matter how competent or incompetent the son might be. And uh, there are no, there's no shortage of examples of this. Uh, the more the value of the waqf, the faster this happens. Now this had and has the expected effect of disillusionment of the capable and the promoting of psychophants until the circle of self-deception and incompetence is complete. We see this happening even in the case of our Muslim jamaats and institutions, not just the awqaf in terms of charitable endowments, but also in terms of jamaats, in terms of organizations, in terms of uh, movements, in terms of uh, Muslim institutions, as in uh, colleges and, uh, and uh, other kinds of uh, Muslim organizations, uh, we see the same thing happening. Now, how many of you can name an organization or movement which had one charismatic leader who created the organization and the rest of them ride on that bandwagon while the leadership goes from father to son? I'm sure many you can name uh, many such Muslim organizations and the uh, the the it, it's a it's a list of it's like a litany of uh, of names. Um, what we what we fail to understand or we do not want to understand is that genetics, uh, your surname, your relationship uh, with the founder is not a compensation and it does not uh, compensate for competence. Uh, history is brutally witness to this. The question is how much longer do we wish to continue this toxic system? Um, I remind you and myself that success does not depend on who. It depends on what. A plane does not fly only when a certain person flies it or a certain person comes and sits in the, in the cockpit. It flies when anyone who knows what to do does it. The son of a pilot can inherit the plane but not the skill of flying. 
the plane flies because of the skill not because of the name on the ownership certificate and i don't under, i don't see why why this is so difficult for people to understand and this is unfortunately the the, the situation that we find uh, the same thing applies therefore to aukaf and it applies to uh, muslim organization then applies to any kind of organization muslim or non muslim uh, if you have an organization which is based purely uh, where the leadership is chosen because of your name it's because of your relationship with the founder of the of the organization then believe me you have a a, a formula for downfall um we see this uh, same thing happening also in masjid committees uh, which are populated by those who funded the masjid they have good hearts uh, they have noble intentions but they don't know the first thing about running an organization uh once again my favorite example the difference between buying a plane and flying it one needs money the other needs time and effort and learning and dedication and lots of experience acquired under the guidance of an expert right you can't just go and sit in a plane and try and fly it you can but <laughs> you know the result um find me a pilot who learned flying without going through this mill organization development conflict resolution effective communication team building and leadership are not inherited they don't happen because you had the money to set up the organization they don't happen because of who your father or mother was neither do you learn them in medical school or engineering school engineering college or madrasa or even in business school you don't learn how to run an organization professionally because you went to medical school or you went to engineering college or even in a madrasa you don't learn that so you can be an alim <clears throat> you can be a doctor you can be a surgeon you can be uh, a, a great engineer an architect uh, a boat builder ship builder that does not make you an organization expert i don't know why this is so difficult to understand but i guess i i i have example after example in country after country where well meaning uh, good people generous people who made their money in some place uh, they want to 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 set up a, a masjid or set up an institution for the benefit of people and they they make a absolute hash of it because they uh make they, they put in the money they build a structure because building building a structure is a matter of of uh, you know brick and mortar uh the the problem is of running that place and and in the running of the place the biggest mistake absolutely fatal mistake is like a like a bullet in the head which they make is they assume that they have the experience because they set up the place you have the experience of setting up the place you do not have the experience of running the place these are two completely different things and this is something to be uh, clearly understood so uh, how do you acquire the experience of running a place by running a place under the guidance of an expert you learn these these skills of uh, of of uh, running uh, an institution on the ground working in multiple high engagement high personal risk situations under the guidance of others in that space who are capable of and interested in teaching and mentoring you it takes time it takes tears and sometimes blood and there are no certificates in graduation ceremonies you know that you have graduated when you can resolve conflicts you can inspire others you can create a vision and you can transmit and translate that vision into somebody else's hearts and you can leave behind a legacy of honor that is when you know that you learned the lesson well it's not about some worthless piece of paper called a certificate it's about results on the ground and in the hearts of people it's about the memories you leave behind it's about dedication and sincerity and dedication and sincerity are not a substitute for competence and experience both are necessary it's not either or if only we understand there is no substitute for competence i think this is a uh, message that i must give as clearly as possible competence is a stand alone and without competence we will get nowhere 
Another example of what I um, have to say is the what I call the temporary organizations, which means that they start, they, they work in a temporary way, uh, which come alive every Ramadan uh, to collect and disburse zakat. Uh, though, the, uh, though the total amount collected and disbursed is uh, enormous, uh, it's, it's close to half a trillion uh, US dollars, as I mentioned. Uh, you do not see its long-term effect because its distribution and benefit is very local and sporadic. Now, I have nothing against donating locally. I think you should donate. I'm, I'm, I think I, I'm very much in favor of that. I'm only talking about doing things in an organized manner, uh, which gives operational efficiencies, which sporadic work does not give. To help us understand the difference of approach between NGOs and commercial organizations, let me uh, try and compare them. Uh, as you know, I, my, exper my expertise is also in uh, that's my bread and butter. My NGO work is all for free anyway. Uh, my, my bread and butter is as an organizational consultant in some of the uh, biggest corporate names uh, in the world, uh, as well as in many family business organizations, some very big ones. Uh, so let me try and compare the two. Now let's take business organizations. There are five things that distinguish a business organization. Number one, they have clear measurable goals. Uh, long-term goals and short-term goals, clear, measurable goals. Uh, people who work there, the employees, they join primarily for material benefits. Primarily, they, they would also have an interest in what's happening, but primarily they join for material benefits. Number three, uh, motivation is related to received benefits, um, which means more is more. Uh, the higher the salary, the higher the, the better the perks, the better the working conditions, I mean physical working conditions, uh, more is the employee, uh, longer is the employee retention, uh, better is the employee engagement, uh, and uh, less is the employee turnover. Uh, number four, output, an employee's output and the organization's output is measured and measurement is appreciated. You like to do that because it makes you feel good, plus it's a record that you actually produce that much and that measurement is done, it's done annually, it's done uh, sub-annually, it's done usually quarterly, so you have a quarterly assessment, uh, mid-term or half-yearly assessment and then annual assessment. Um, there are budgets and you, um, you, you fulfill what you have committed to. Uh, and number five, uh, very important, is there is a strategic focus and consistency of results is rewarded. So if you are running a corporate organization and you have a, a, a big gain one year and then you have a big loss the next year, that's not appreciated. It, you, you, people are they're looking for sustained uh, production and sustained productivity uh, over the long term. So these are five things. Clear measurable goals, employees join primarily for material benefits, motivation is related to received benefits, uh, output is measured and measurement is appreciated and strategic focus uh, and consistency of results is rewarded. Now come to NGOs. Again, five uh, distinguishing features. Goals are not always clear or measured and goals keep shifting. I mean, they, they, an NGO may have been set up for one thing, but suddenly there is a need and then the people come and say, oh, you know what, we need to do that as well. So <clears throat> I have, for example, an NGO which is set up for the purpose of education and suddenly there is uh, a disaster somewhere and people come and say, no, please, we have to go there and we must give money for that because this is disaster and somebody has to. Now, the point is that nobody asks the question, yes, yes, I agree, somebody has to do that. Why does that somebody have to be me and my organization? Because we have a certain budget, we have, we have certain considerations and we are set up for a certain purpose. If you are going to move away from that, it defeats the primary purpose for which we are set up. Why can't we understand that? But we can't. So anyway, so goals are not always clear or measured. Number two, employees join for emotional reasons. Yeah, by and large, of course, they also join for the money and this is where the conflict happens. But generally speaking, they join for emotional reasons. Number three, motivation is related more to interpersonal relations. Now, people join for people. Now, that's true also in corporate organizations. We, we say this all the time. We say people don't for work for a company. They work for other people. So the management, uh, manager, uh, employee relationships are very important. Uh, but they're far more important in an NGO. Uh, number four, output is not measured and there is an allergy to measurement. I mean, it's almost uh, 
like a death knell if you go to a NGO and say, uh, let's do a performance appraisal of uh, your employees. I mean, nobody likes that word. Uh, which, and I think this is a very, um, it's a very dangerous thing not to like your performance to be measured. Uh, and the number one, and the number, the fifth one is I mentioned that, that earlier. It is the work is event driven uh, and it is sporadic. So, like I said, Ramadan, everyone gets energized. Uh, we have this this practice of of giving Ramadan food, Ramadan hampers uh, to a lot of poor people, right? Uh, I always, I mean, jokingly, but sort of. Uh, uh, quasi jokingly, I, I say to my friends, uh, you are giving the Ramadan hampers to human beings or to pythons? Uh, because uh, pythons eat once in a year, uh, depending on how much food you give them, not human beings. So if you are saying that I'm giving a hamper of food to a poor person uh, in Ramadan, that's wonderful, brilliant. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, but does that person eat only in Ramadan? I mean, after Ramadan, they stop eating or what? So if they are really poor and if they, re if they, if they really need that food, uh, then uh, how about thinking about thinking of them for the rest of the year? But that, uh, that uh, you know, by, doesn't seem to happen. In Ramadan, we get very energized because of uh, the enhanced rewards and so on and so forth. But we forget that the one who is giving the rewards did not say that he will refuse to give the reward in any other month uh, if you do the same amount of charity for the same reason, which is the pleasure, his pleasure, for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anyway, that's uh, aside from uh, my lecture today, so I'm not going into that area. Now, please understand that when I have mentioned these five and five, the differences between uh, corporate or business organizations and NGOs, uh, these are not mutually exclusive differences. Uh, some will overlap. Uh, people in business organizations are also motivated, for example, uh, by interpersonal relationships. Yeah, but I'm mentioning these as general overall differences, uh, which are based on the difference in focus of the two kinds of organizations. And these are important differences. Uh, there's almost a prohibition and disapproval about speaking the language of money and business in an NGO atmosphere as if it's a crime and this produces its own hypocrisy of approach because money is important and money is essential. Pretending that it isn't creates a needless conflict of values and it creates avoidable tension. By implication, this disapproval also extends to all measuring and reporting systems that are routinely used in business organizations. And uh, to put it very bluntly, that is the secret of success and growth of business organizations. The challenge is how can we use them in NGOs? And as I said, my focus here is Muslim NGOs uh, to make the operations more efficient and effective. In Muslim NGOs, uh, there is often a confusion between thawab and measurable results. The fact is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you more reward for better work. So quality must never be compromised for any reason. But most often, quality is the first casualty. Anyone insisting on quality is seen as commercial and will face disapproval of various uh, kinds and um, disapproval of various magnitude. Um, so let me ask you a few questions uh, which I want you to reflect on and uh, answer for yourself. Number one, what is your vision? As I'm talking to people running NGOs and uh, especially Muslim NGOs, uh, what is your vision? Uh, who are you and why do you exist? As an organization, I'm saying, who are you and why do you exist? What is your differentiator? What sets you apart from everybody else? What is unique about you and what you do? Um, what will happen to your beneficiaries if you are no longer there, if you vanish? Uh, number four is, what are you not? Now, that's very important. Uh, in some cases, it's even more important. Uh, so, what are you not? Because trying to be everything to everyone means that you are nothing to anyone. Number five, do you exist to eliminate the need that you are trying to fulfill or is that need sustaining you? Now, I know that's a tough one to answer and it's a painful one to answer. Uh, but are you creating dependence or are you creating independence? Because many times NGOs exist for the sake of the NGO. They exist because <clears throat> this is your means of survival. This is your sustenance this is your within quotes business and i say that that is a 
very negative way of running an NGO. An NGO must exist in order to fulfill a need, meaning that it must make itself redundant. There should come a time in a specific measurable foreseen time frame where you no longer are necessary because what you were trying to do happened and that was it. But that's not how it happens. Uh, it's like, for example, take healthcare. Uh, today, healthcare hospitals exist for the purpose of the hospital. And that's why I am, I am dead against corporate hospitals. I think corporatization of uh, healthcare and uh, education are two of the worst crimes that have been committed against society. Because corporate hospital, uh, hospitals means that the hospital is a business. If the hospital is a business, then that business will suffer if there are healthy people. There's a famous story uh, from the Sira that the, um, the Mukaukis of Egypt, the, 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 uh, the, the uh, Eastern Christian, uh, Christian Empire, which was based in Egypt, uh, the, the head of that, he sent uh, some gifts for the Prophet And among those gifts, he sent two physicians because they were very good in Egypt uh, in terms of medicine. Uh, so the Mukaukis, he sent uh, two physicians. Um, they came, they stayed in Medina with Rasulullah uh, for two years. And at the end of two years, they came to him and they said, we request your permission to go back home. So Rasulullah said, are you unhappy? I mean, is there somebody who's bothering you? Uh, you don't like being here or what's the story? He said, no, we are very happy. I mean, you know, you're very generous and people are very hospitable and so on and so forth. And we like living here, but we have no work. He said, nobody is sick, nobody falls sick in this place. So what do we do? I mean, we, uh, we will lose our skills if we are going to stay in this place because the people are healthy. And the people are healthy because they work hard, they eat less, they, you know, they're focused on uh, what they're doing. So they said, there's no work. Now, this is what must happen uh, in, uh, with regard to healthcare. The focus must be on increasing health and decreasing sickness to a point where hospitals are no longer necessary. Short of, short of accidents, somebody breaks a leg or something, there should be no need for hospitals. I know in a, in a big city, in an in, in, in a institution, that will not happen. You will still have a job. But you, the point is, your focus is what? Is it on, on health or is it on sickness? <clears throat> Today, the focus of the medical industry, I mean, just calling it these names to me is an insult. There was a time when I was growing up where uh, for a doctor and a lawyer, these were two professions, an attorney and a, a medical practitioner. Uh, it was not even legal for them to publicly advertise their jobs. You never ever saw a billboard uh, with the names and the faces of doctors or hospitals or attorneys because these were considered to be uh, life-saving services offered to a community they were not commercialized uh, they were not sold and that's why doctors had this enormous dignity my father was a doctor and I know the kind of dignity he had and the kind of love and the kind of respect of people that he had today uh, we, we don't find we find people doctors are being stoned I'm not saying that's a good thing that's a very very bad thing that's utterly and totally and abysmally shameful. But having said that, a uh, medical profession has lost its glow because of the way it has been commercialized. Now, uh, sorry for the rant, but uh, I'm, I'm just saying that uh, this is because uh, you, if you do not, uh, if, you, if you are in a helping profession, and that's what NGOs are all about, uh, without the desire to help, meaning, there should be no need for what you do because you have fulfilled that need. People no longer need you because, alhamdulillah, they are standing on their own feet. If that is not your focus, then you are a parasite. You exist from the blood of the people who you claim to serve. I'm sorry to be, to be blunt about that, but that's the reality. So you are creating dependence and that work is sustaining you instead of you uh, being focused on, on eliminating even the need for that work. NGOs, for example, who are focused on the, elim on, on, the, elev uh, on the elevation of poverty, on the elimination of poverty, what should happen? There should be no more poor people. 
For example, in a Muslim context, you should be in a society where you take your zakat and there is nobody who is eligible to receive it. That is the ideal situation. I mean, that may never happen. But if your whole focus is when you are saying eliminate poverty, your focus, if it is really to ensure that poverty continues to exist so that I continue to have a job, then something is very seriously wrong with the approach uh, to, that, uh, to, that, uh, to that work. So therefore, the check is ask what will happen to you if those you claim to be helping become self-sufficient. Ask yourself this question, what will happen to me if the people I claim to be helping, uh, if they become self-sufficient, then what happens to me? So are you uh, working to make yourself redundant or to ensure that your beneficiaries will always continue to need you? How do you measure uh, results and effectiveness? I'm talking about the list of things for NGOs and I'll give you the, the document of this as well so you don't have to remember uh, uh, the list in your, in your head. So how do you measure uh, the results and effectiveness? In business, it is sales revenue. That's very straight. Very straight. Uh, but in an NGO, what is the measure? So how do you measure that? Um, do you have a documented strategic plan going forward? And ten, number 10 is, do you have financial control systems, management reporting systems, and a code of conduct documented and followed? So these are the 10 things that I... 10 questions that I request you to answer for yourself, which will give you a diagnosis of how you are doing as an NGO. Uh, as an NGO. Now, uh, some common challenges and weaknesses in NGOs which I have seen over the many years of my associating as a consultant. Number one is where I began, which is a lack of strategic planning and lack of strategic action and lack of uh, focus on long-lasting results. Sporadic, emotional, temporary. Number two is a loose financial and administrative systems or a complete lack of financial and administrative systems and a great hesitancy to create or implement them even more to enforcing them. Number three, volunteering often results in low or no discipline and again, a hesitancy in enforcing professional standards because confusion between kindness and brotherhood leads to tolerating substandard sloppy work. So it's almost like saying, I'm doing you a favor by, by showing up. So now don't ask me to be productive. Don't ask me for deadlines. Don't ask me that something that you promised to deliver. Uh, if, you, if I haven't delivered, uh, that's okay. You know, live with that. Uh, don't question me with, about it. And this is the kind of attitude that uh, volunteering seems to produce, especially in Muslims. And I'm saying that this is a totally net negative uh, attitude. Uh, quality must never be compromised and substandard sloppy work is substandard sloppy work and it's a disgrace to the one who is doing it and it's a disgrace to the one who is accepting it whether you are an NGO or not doesn't matter. Uh, number four is susceptibility therefore also to emotional blackmail by organizational members and hopeful beneficiaries. So if somebody does something you say and you want to reprimand that person and God forbid you want to sack that person, people say no, 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 you know, remember he's your brother and he's also a Muslim and uh, you know, you will answer to Allah. You know what you will answer to Allah for? You will answer to Allah for being unjust. You will answer to Allah for allowing uh, substandard work and for for sacrificing quality uh, you will not answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for insisting on quality because the image of your organization and the image of Islam is far more important than tolerating substandard sloppy work and even worse tolerating dishonesty from a person because they are Muslim it should be the opposite but unfortunately this is the kind of culture that we have created Number five, unsure and volatile sources of funding, uh, which is a zakat. And sadaqah suddenly comes out of the blue in Ramadan and then disappears. Now, therefore, it's very difficult to think in terms of long-term project planning. And number six is the confusion about the role of ulama and non-ulama in running the organization which produces its own tensions. Ulama, for some reason, which I have failed to understand, get this... Uh, 
uh, this aura of uh, knowing everything. Right? It, you do not know everything. I'm sorry about that. Uh, it, 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 if you knew everything, then you would not go to a doctor uh, as an alim. If you would not go to a doctor, if you have palpitations in your heart, right? You would go to another alim. You would go to a mufti and say, "Please tell me what I must do because uh, I have palpitations." Or please go to. Uh, you would go to a mufti, or you would go to a hafiz, or you would go to a mufassir or a or a muhaddis and uh, ask what you must do. Uh, because you have a headache uh, or for whatever reason, right? You don't do that. You go to a doctor. Why? Because you know that your knowledge is in a specific area. This does not mean it is, uh, it is unworthy. It does not mean uh, anything other than the knowledge of any expert in any area. If I'm a medical professional, I'm an expert in medicine. I'm not an expert in building a house. So if I'm building my house and I try to build my own house, it will probably collapse on my head. I need an architect, I need a structural engineer, and I need a builder to build my house properly so that I can live in that house comfortably. I can go to the builder and the architect and the structural engineer and tell them what kind of things I want in my house. But to try to build the house myself and say, well, I know because I'm a doctor is complete and total nonsense. And that's exactly the same, no matter what your area of specialization is. So if you are an alim, stay in the purview of your knowledge where you people, where people ask you questions, what you don't know, don't answer, send them to the expert and vice versa. If you are not an alim, don't try and give fatwas and don't try and make something halal and haram because within quotes it makes sense to you. It's not a matter of sense. It's a matter of sense as well as fulfilling the requirements, the theological requirements of something. So I think this staying within the boundaries is a very, very important thing. Uh, what aggravates this is also because people go to ulama. I've had, I've seen many, uh, I've had many instances where uh, entrepreneurs, you know, because that's my part of my uh, consulting practice is uh, is entrepreneurship development. So entrepreneurs, Muslim entrepreneurs come to me uh, and they say, you know, I wanted to do this business and so on. And I went to my sheikh and my sheikh uh, gave me his blessing. I said, what is this blessing? Now, is he making us dua for you? Alhamdulillah, most welcome. Please do that. But if it is anything other than that, what does your sheikh know about business? Is your sheikh a business? If your sheikh is also a businessman, and there was a time when our sheikh were businessmen. Now, uh, I think we are a long way away from that. So I say, if your sheikh is a businessman, yeah, then fine. But if he's not a businessman, what advice is he giving you? Why did you go to the sheikh? You should go to a business person and ask for his advice because that advice is useful for you because he knows what he's talking about. Right? So please understand this in NGOs. This is another big area of confusion. Now, five key areas, therefore, to focus on. Number one, clear values and goals. Number two, strategy and strategic thinking. Please understand two different things, strategy and strategic thinking. Number three is metrics and process review, measurement. What you measure, you know. What you don't measure, you don't know. What you measure, you guarantee. What you don't measure, you cannot guarantee. Number four is leadership and successor development. And number five is to, is to think systemically, not only systematically, to think systemically. So let's quickly, I'm just going to list uh, all of these things uh, and uh, you will get the document as well. So number one, in clear values and goals, what do you stand for? What are your core values and how are these visible in your work life? What are the operative definitions of the core value? If I say my core value is honesty in my organization, where can you see that honesty? If I say my core value is honesty and I don't tell lies, but I'm maintaining two books of accounts, one to show to the tax man and one for myself, then my core value is not honesty. I am a thief. I call myself uh, honest because I'm trying to deceive the government. I'm trying to uh, fudge my taxes. Where is the honesty? So we have to understand this. If you say something is your value, then that must be visible in your work, in everything you say and do. And if it is not visible, then that's not your value. So what do you stand for? What are the core values? And I call them operative definitions. How do how can I see that? How how do you how do you see that? What is the measurement? Number two, why do you exist? What's your core purpose? What will happen if you are no longer in that space? Number three, what is your goal? What's your vision? Uh, who does it help? And what do, will it do for you to achieve that? Uh, point number two is strategy, strategy and strategic thinking. 
uh, strategic thinking means to be proactive. It doesn't mean to be reactive. Number two, it's strategic thinking means to act before the need. And that's the meaning of being proactive. Number three, strategic thinking must permeate the organization. It's not, it's not sufficient for only the founder or the top management to be strategic, strategic, strategically focused, whereas everyone else is not. Number four is strategic thinking means investment in people. Now, all of these must be measurable and must be visible in your organization. To take just one example to illustrate, if I say that strategic thinking means investment in people, then as an NGO, if I ask you, what was your investment in your people? What did you do to help your people to become more competent, more capable, uh, more efficient, more effective in the last 12 months, you should be able to give me specific details. And if you can't do that, it means that this thing of being strategic in terms of people development does not exist in your organization. Point number three, <clears throat> metrics and process review. Uh, what you don't measure, you cannot guarantee. So therefore, what are your processes for good governance, for transparency, and for accountability. Number three is who or what is your benchmark. And please understand, be very careful before saying, my benchmark is Rasulullah Sallallahu my benchmark is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu because that's a very, very high standard. Please understand that. Don't just say these things. That's a very high standard. I suggest pick somebody below that so that you have still a benchmark that you can, uh, you can aim at. So who's your benchmark? Uh, who is uh, who are you you comparing against and very important benchmark also I would suggest that if I am consulting with a with a NGO I would say give me a benchmark in today's world as an NGO don't tell me the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or Umar bin Al-Khattab or Abu, Abu Bakr Siddiq Anhuma. give me a organizational benchmark in today's world who is that because that also shows that you have some kind of a global perspective in terms of the NGO world. And number four is what are your processes, specific processes visible, documented for recruitment, for succession planning, for leadership development, for performance appraisal and for compensation and for severance. If somebody is leaving or has to be asked to leave, what is the actual process? Um, number five is leadership and uh, successor uh, development or was it number four anyway uh, what does leadership mean in your context um, and if the leadership in your context means that you have to be the son of somebody then that's not leadership as simple as that so what does leadership mean in your context number two who is your benchmark for leadership once again looking at our peers uh, looking at people in our time of uh, history uh, what are the processes to identify successors and to groom men and to groom and mentor successors for them to take over? And do you have a retirement date? Do your lead do your leaders have a retirement date, or does a successor have to wait for you to drop dead before he becomes a successor? That's a very very big problem with Muslim NGOs, with Muslim organizations, and that is something that must be addressed. And number four is, uh, point number four is, what is the system to ensure that succession happens in a logical, time-bound manner? And that's what I'm talking about. Any organization where the leaders do not have a retirement date is an organization that lacks leadership, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, what are the indicators of this? Number one, specific, specified retirement age, which is not exceeded for anybody. It's not to say that, you know, I'm supposed to retire at 65 and, uh, oh, but you know what, uh, Sheikh Yavari, you are healthy and so on. Uh, and, uh, you know, we really need you. So we will extend the retirement date for you from 65 to 70. No, you will not. 65 means 65. By all means, that does not mean that if I'm working with you, that I will stop working with you. No, I mean, give me a different, different uh, role as an advisor, as a mentor and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, like we have in universities, you have uh, a professor emeritus, uh, that kind of a role, but not as 
a executive leader of the organization because if there is an executive leadership it must have a retirement date number two formal leadership development and mentoring program uh, with measurement metrics and that actually begins with formal uh, uh, leadership identification so you need to identify successors uh, and develop and mentor them and as I, again as i said please anything there where the identification of the successor is dependent on uh, the relationship the the biological relationship of the successor to the leader you are looking at an organization which is going to perish as simple as that um, number three is how do you deal with dissent and creativity and is change and the focus towards change is it rewarded in your NGO or is that a problem uh, is that something that becomes uh, is it seen as something which is negative um, then the question of robust systems and are these followed consistently now that's a that's a, a very important one it's just having a system uh, which is not followed makes no sense. You, do you have a system? And if you have a system, is that system followed consistently? Come to the last of, the, of my points, which is thinking systemically. Um, meaning, keeping the welfare of the whole system in mind when you are thinking. Now, think and see systemically, meaning the vision of the organization, uh, what you are doing and so on and so forth, not just being even driven or uh, ideology driven or personally uh, personality driven but being focused on the vision of the organization number two what are you doing to educate your people to think systemically and number three is how are you building perspective in your people all of these things are very important in terms of NGO management now uh, what are the uh, cures. So let's look at quickly the solutions to uh, the things that I'm mentioning. Um, there are some allergies. I call these my uh, five allergies that need to be cured. Um, one is the allergy to measurement of results. That's the first one, which needs to be cured. Allergy to measurement of results. Number two is the allergy to financial transparency. Uh, if you ask somebody to be to to uh, to be to hold themselves accountable and to maintain proper accounting systems uh, it's almost like uh, you have you know personally insulted them or something people people act like that uh, number three is the allergy to uh, work reporting and to following of rules and number four is the allergy to being questioned and number five I mean, question I'm not saying personally I'm saying as far as the work is concerned number five uh, is the allergy to succession planning and development the allergy to questioning is so pronounced and, and may Allah uh, you know forgive us uh, it's the worst and the most pronounced uh, in the ulama in the in the scholars who are associated with an NGO uh, you dare not question them if you if you ask any question with regard to their performance with regard to their uh, output and delivery uh, they it, it's, it's like calling down the wrath uh, of uh, God on your head. I mean, it's uh, this is a very, very bad uh, attitude we have. If we want to work in an organization, then we have to learn to work in a professional way. Uh, I think that's that applies across the board. It doesn't matter what your area of competence, what your area of expertise is, you must and absolutely, totally, there's no uh, alternative to that. You must operate and you must be prepared to work in a professional way and a professional way means measurement there will be somebody who will ask you about your output and you must be able to deliver that answer and and document that and there's nothing to feel bad about it it's not it's it's they're not being disrespectful uh, they are not uh, you know discounting you and your expertise it is you bought into that when you joined that organization if you can't take that leaf Go and set up like we used to have in the old days. You had the sheikh sitting by himself in, in, in you know, some jungle somewhere and, and his competence and his ability and his, and his uh, uh, gravitas was so much that people would go and they would stay with him and live with him and he would teach them and yeah, do that, no problem. But if you want to be part of an organization, then organizational norms and practices and systems must 
take precedence. Uh, they must be implemented and whoever is running that organization must implement them. Um, now, in your question, that's why I sometimes ask, ask people this question. You want to know if you are professionally run or not? Ask a simple question. Who in your organization cannot be questioned? If you have anybody in the organization who cannot be questioned, then you are not running it in a professional way. Um, I call this a dilemma of the givers, uh, which is exploitation becomes the natural response to the servant leader. This is, I'm now looking at it from the followership, the employees, uh, also the uh, beneficiaries or potential beneficiaries of an NGO. They treat the leadership uh, and, uh, as if, uh, you know, they are their servants and they resort to emotional blackmail and the most usual thing is oh but you know i mean uh, special rules for me because i am muslim i'm sorry that doesn't work that does not work as far as i'm concerned it doesn't work it didn't work even with the if you look at the sirah of rasulullah if you look at the uh, people like sayyidina umar al khattab anhu, who were known uh, to run a very uh, efficient house uh, they did not treat people differently. They treated people on the basis of uh, measurable uh, standards, right? They didn't give uh, things to somebody just because the person was a Muslim. Personal charity, you like to give something, most welcome, please do that. But don't compel the organization to do that. Number two is to give without expectation. This is the whole uh, thing, the, this, this entire, uh, you know, system is built up. Oh, brother, but you know, I'm your brother and I'm, um, I, 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 this is uh, charity and Allah will be pleased with you. And, uh, you know, your reward is only with Allah and uh, you must obey your elders. Uh, you must give without expectation uh, and, and you must never question and you must, you must always, you know, keep your mouth shut as far as, uh, uh, as, as far as being taken advantage of his concern and so on and these people saying all of this are laughing all the way to the bank think about that there are many people who come to you and say you know I want your advice I want your advice to uh, to help uh, me set up as an entrepreneur uh, as a as a businessman people come to me and uh, a lot of Muslim people come to me and say I want to set up as an entrepreneur as a businessman and I want you to help me. I said, no problem. I'd be delighted to do that because that is my professional, that is my profession. That's what I do uh, in my business of, of organization consulting and entrepreneurship development. Uh, oh, no, 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 Sheikh. I mean, you know, I'm a Muslim. Sheikh, I'm your brother, Sheikh. Uh, I want you to help me um, uh, to, uh, you know, to, to uh, set up a business so that I can become, become a multi-millionaire, billionaire, uh, so I can drive around in a Ferrari and you can still cycle to work because you are a stupid Sheikh to give me all of this advice for free and I laugh, I, I laugh all the way to the bank. And Sheikh, you know, your reward is with Allah. Come on, man, give me a break, right? I wasn't born yesterday. My beard didn't get uh, white uh, sitting in the sun, so give me a break. You want something, then you have to be prepared to pay for it. As simple as that. Somebody uh, tells me, I want to become a, uh, a life coach and I want to become an organizational consultant. Uh, please advise me. And as I'm talking to them, sometimes I ask them this question. I say, you know what? If I was charging you a fee, would we still be having this conversation? Answer is no. Because if I was charging you a fee, then you would not want to pay the fee and you want to go to somebody who you can con to give you advice for free well you know you come you came to the wrong person i i i, I'm, I have uh, I, i'm too uh, old and i'm too uh, i've seen too many people like that to be taken advantage of so do not fall into this trap as a leader uh, don't fall into this trap don't allow anyone to emotionally blackmail you uh, your reward is with allah and that fellow's reward also is with allah so he wants you to give to him for his benefit, right? They sell you this whole story, great shop story, blah, 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 of this happened, this happened, this happened, and there are people dying everywhere, and you know, there's this uh, rivers of blood flowing, so you must donate, very nice. How much did you donate? Ask him, how much did you donate? So you must donate so I can drive around in a, in, a, in a Land Cruiser. You must donate because I want the latest gadget. You must donate because my children go to the best schools. What, what kind of stuff is that? 
What kind of stuff is that? That I call exploitation. That I call deception. That I call stealing in the name of Islam, stealing in the name of Allah. Please, don't fall into this trap. I'm not saying that NGO leaders must necessarily walk around with their, you know, in torn clothes and they must live in a, in a grass hut under a tree. No. And that's the reason I'm saying professionalize the NGO so that both parties benefit. You have a proper organization where people, the aspirations of the people in the organization are also met and you also use the funds that you get in a professional, accountable manner. Um, so, therefore, who must you give? Not, not to everyone. Don't confuse generosity with selflessness. Don't accept substandard work in the name of kindness. Number three, effective givers recognize that every no frees you up to say yes when it matters the most. Uh, there's a wonderful article of in, um, in uh, Harvard Business Review which talks about this and I'm going to put that in the uh, in the description of this video. Uh, so do read that article. And number four, amplify your impact by looking for ways to be to help multiple people with a single act of generosity. And that is what I call uh, systematizing and making a process instead of sporadic giving. You know, teach a man to fish. You remember that story, right? Give a man a fish, he eats for a day. Teach a man to fish and he eats for life. That is the point I'm saying. One act of kindness uh, is done in a way which has a long-term impact. And number five, find ways to give without depleting your time and energy because your needs are equally important. Um, I'm coming to the uh, close of my lecture last but by no means the least last and probably the most important why do i put it last because this is the most the toughest of, of all things which is your own tarbiya who is your mentor who is your muslim who is the person who will correct you alhamdulillah i have a mentor i have a muslim uh, i have people in my life who correct me and I hugely appreciate them and I go to them and I ask them for correction. Everyone needs correction. Abu Hassan al-Ladwi used to say that the one who feels that he is beyond the need for correction is sitting in the lap of shaitan. Jo apne aap ko islah se mustaghni samjhe, wo shaitan ki god mein baitha hua hai. So please understand that. Who is your mentor? Who is your Muslim? If you do not have a mentor, if you do not have a person to correct you, go find one now. Number two, what is your criterion for picking that person? Are you picking a person who always agrees with you? Now believe me, I'm not, I'm not saying that there is something uh, great about a person who never praises you, who always criticizes you. Such people only deplete your energy, get rid of them. They are worthless. Because if they cannot see anything good in you, then they can't see, they, then, they, then they have no right to uh, try to correct you. So you need somebody who is your, your close friend, who cheers for you, who is in your corner, uh, who appreciates you, who praises you, who, uh, who comforts you, but who also will tell you what you need to hear, not only what you want to hear. That's, that's the, the criteria of the, of the Muslim, uh, and it must be somebody who also practices what they preach. Number three, what is your tarbiya program and what are its metrics? Zuhud, which is personal worship, personal uh, discipline in life and tarbiya is to seek uh, correction and to focus on improving ourselves as we go forward. These are two things which have, which seems to have been by and large lost and that's very, very uh, tragic. It's very, very, uh, and also it's very symbolic and that's the reason why uh, we are in the mess that we are in. So what's your personal tarbiya program and what are its mess metrics? And from an organizational perspective, uh, how do you involve everyone in it? Now, all of this is to help us to become better and to help us to uh, to, to become more effective and the reason for that is that we can only give what we have so what do you have what do you have I'm sorry to be uh, you know moving around so much and, and my I, I'm sitting in a place where we seem to have uh, uh, a lot of uh, flying small flying insects uh, which uh, are after my blood 
Now, why am I sitting here? Because I've run out of places to, places to sit in. It's very, very hot and sunny everywhere else. And yesterday, my iPad uh, got so hot that I had to put it in the fridge to cool it uh, because I got a, 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 an alert to say emergency iPad is too hot. So I had to put it in the fridge. So I, I, I'm sitting here. Uh, nice location except for all of these insects. So my apologies. Finally, in conclusion, uh, I must say that what is necessary is to put clear systems in place which will ensure the continuity of the work. Whereas the NGO in terms of its external focus towards its beneficiaries may be very selfless, the reality is that people who work in it are subject to the same tensions, the same pressures, the same allurements, the same aspirations and the same fears as people working in any organization and often with, with much less clarity about what they can or cannot do, their career paths and their reporting relationships and so on. I believe therefore that the greater the clarity on organizational processes, the happier will be those who work with you and your output will be much more efficient and caring. It is essential to spend time to establish robust systems without bureaucracy to facilitate smooth operations. Now these would include the following 10 things. Number one, articulating a vision uh, to which members of the organization are equally committed and the challenge is to transfer this across time from generation to generation from from one from the from existing people to every new recruit number two articulating core values of the organization and their operative definitions so that their practice can be measured and monitored a value is only what you practice it is not what you talk about and many times we look at we have we see situations where we say oh but you know these are islamic values well when was the last time muslims practiced it and don't tell me this is how it used to be in the 7th century or the 9th century it doesn't matter what matters is what is happening today in the 21st century uh, a value is what is visible without the need to explain it uh, then we need what uh, i call robust recruitment uh, processes which are based on a shared vision and clearly defined criteria of education and experience. Formal induction of recruits is an absolutely critical necessity. Number four is changing the mindset from I'm doing a favor to mankind to professional accountability for performance. Number five is strong budgeting, goal, system, goal setting, performance management systems which must be created and followed. The key to the effectiveness of any system is that there can be no exceptions in that system. Um, performance is not what you feel you did but what is visible and measurable as clear performance management a clear performance management system is the best resource for the professional and uh, it is the best way to ensure that the organization culture remains free from politics number six to create ongoing financial resources instead of being dependent on occasional periodic sporadic charity a sustained source of funds makes it possible to plan and execute long-term initiatives therefore endowment funds is the way to go number seven is succession planning and mentoring and this is usually totally absent uh, with hero worship of the founder taking its place and so when the founder dies because in our organizations no founder ever retires uh, there is vicious infighting and the organization breaks up the bigger the organization the worse the conflict because the stakes are much higher uh, I don't want to embarrass you, so I'm not mentioning names and I'm not mentioning the names of organizations, but you know very clearly that in our Muslim society, there is not one example, there are plenty of examples. This is almost the rule. Number eight, systematic and early identification of successors, uh, training them, exposing them to graduated challenges, including working outside the organization, mentoring them, and mentors can be 
external resources as well and giving them increasing responsibility as appropriate. Uh, all of these are necessary. Assessing them for suitability and having a spare uh, or multiple spares are all important. It is essential to remember that not only is it necessary to be completely objective and strict in assessment of the progress of potential successors, but to do the opposite, which is to be lax and so-called soft, is highly destructive and it is the primary reason why the lifetime achievement and contribution of the founder gets squandered in just one generation. Most importantly, in an NGO, the relationship of the successor to the founder, meaning the biological relationship, the family relationship of the successor to the founder, um, this is uh, something which is of no consequence and if it is made to be of consequence uh, then that is the lethal fatal mistake and unfortunately once again that is something that happens most often uh, number nine is since many if not uh, most NGOs are dependent on personal commitment of major donors it is essential to ensure that these relationships uh, are nurtured and they remain uh, especially when the uh, founders die and that therefore before that the connections are passed on to the successors most relationships are by definition personal to begin with and that has to be uh, transferred but if they can be converted to loyalty for the organization the relationship may have begun as a personal relationship but if it can be converted into loyalty for the organization that is most beneficial now that's how for example Harvard the endowment fund for Harvard is worth 39 billion fastest growing endowment fund and that happens because of the perceived value of the service that the organization offers it it now transcends the 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 uh, the boundaries or the connections of a personal connection number 10 uh, finally there must be strong financial systems and controls while minimizing bureaucracy which is very important because bureaucracy usually gets created in the name of financial controls you know apply for permission in in, in uh, with three copies that's rubbish because bureaucracy only slows down operations and adds no value zero value uh, bean counters demand justification for an extra egg that a person ate for breakfast they only aggravate instead of facilitating operations and they add no value we are not talking about bean counters I'm talking about about financial controls uh, which are minimal but which are foolproof we don't want to rely on people's personal honesty or their level of piety in today's world we want to rely on measured systems and on implementing uh, those systems including paying of penalties where they are violated NGOs play a hugely critical role in society, especially today when we are faced with predatory politicians and self-serving governments whose priorities are far away from the welfare of the people. You only have to look at the defense budget of any nation and compare it to the budget for education and public health. And I can rest my case. The reality of life is that you get what you pay for. When countries invest more money in weapons of mass destruction than they invest in the welfare of their own people, the effect is expected and entirely visible. The reason this investment happens is because WMD manufacture and sale gives the best ROI, it gives the best return on investment. That's a tragic commentary of the kind of society that we have created globally. That the cost of this, the cost of this ROI is measured in lives destroyed, widows and orphans, rivers of blood and tears, and the hardening of hearts and attitudes. This is neither here nor there, uh, because those whose bank balances swell from that trade, they don't care. They live behind walls, deaf and blind to suffering. NGOs are necessary because they are comprised of those whose hearts are still alive and they are compassionate <coughs> and who can make a real difference to those who need it the most. And that is the reason why NGOs must be run as efficiently 
and effectively as possible because they are the symbols of the best elements of our humanity. Thank you very much uh, for listening to me for this period of time and I look forward to chatting with you uh, about any questions and answers. I uh, request you to listen to this lecture carefully and to read the document that goes with it before you come to the live Q&A session so that we can uh, deal with uh, some value-added questions based on what I have said and I don't have people asking me questions which I have already addressed in the document as well as in the lecture. Thank you very much and uh, look forward to seeing you and to answering your questions.